Welcome back. We are still here with our friend and colleague, Dr. Dale Bredesen, and we are talking about his book, The End of Alzheimer's Program. And in this episode, we're going to actually answer questions. Um, so one question I have, Dr. Bredesen, is really, um, we often talk about how even if you've been bad to your brain, you can still make it better. So you're not stuck with the brain you have. But in your program, tell us about some of the cases that you know of. I'd love to hear about a specific case where someone's been really pretty bad to their brain or they're they're pretty far down the road with Alzheimer's where their symptoms are really awful and you've seen significant improvement. I actually heard you before we came back on talking about Lewy body dementia. Tell us something that gives people hope that if they were bad to their brain in their 20s or 30s and they know they're headed to the dark place, that they've got hope for coming back if they do this program. Yeah, great point. Um, and let me just mention one of the, one of the people who uh, wrote this with me, uh, the handbook section of it, uh, J- Julie G, who's the one who founded APOE4.info and is herself a 4-4. Um, she had a long history. She had insulin resistance. She got you know gained a little extra weight, as so many of us do. She had ongoing systemic inflammation. Uh, her gut was not in a great shape. She was eating the wrong foods. Uh, she was uh, having, uh, she turned out to have, she had a tick bite, which uh, mm. gave her Lyme that was treated, but she didn't realize until actually she got on the program and we found out she also had gotten Babesia, um, which now being treated for doing very well. So she had all these risk factors. Not only did she start to decline, in fact, her husband would come home from a trip abroad and say, oh yeah, I've been gone for a week or two. You're clearly worse than you were. And she didn't, this was now, she was having problems in her late 40s. And unfortunately, other family members having problems. Just a really sad story. She got to the point where she had to put a sticky on the steering wheel that said drive on the right side of the road. Oh, wow. she was She had been doing some jogging on the left side of the road. And she had to make sure that she didn't get those two mixed up. So she was really struggling and having some issues and she would go shopping, come back and hadn't brought the thing that she bought you know, back home with her. So really significant problems. She scored on her cognitive tests uh, only at a 35th percentile for her age at that time. Um, she then has now eight years on the program doing exceedingly well, scoring 98th, 99th percentile repeatedly, doing absolutely beautifully. She corrected her dietary her exercise part, her stress levels. She corrected her insulin sensitivity. She optimized her nutrients and her vitamin D and her omega-3s and all those things. She ultimately treated her Babesia. She started doing some brain training. All of these things were critical. She checked her toxin status. She has a high fiber, a diet that we call Keto Flex 12-3 because it gives you mild ketosis. And she clearly does better, as so many people do, with some degree of ketosis, typically in the 1.0 to 4.0 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate range. So she has just become really an international emissary for doing the right things and having dramatic improvements in your brain. And you mentioned, what about someone who's really far along? I got a, a critical letter a couple of months ago from a guy who said, my wife is in a nursing home, had a MOCA score of zero. We put her on this program and you tell people get on as early as possible. He said, well, we put her on and she's clearly better. She's dressing herself again. She's interacting with us again. She's speaking again, all these improvements. Now her MOCA score is still low, but she's clearly symptomatically much better than she was. So even with late now, to be fair, the later, as you know, the later, the harder it is to get things turned around. Everybody in the early stages can be turned around. We see it again and again and again and again with people who have subjective cognitive impairment or mild MCI. So tremendous amount you can do, as you indicate. And often the worst thing to do is isolation, put them in a nursing home where they get to choose their food (laughs) because what they choose are the high carb pro-inflammatory foods. Um, Let's talk about diet. I think probably your next book is going to be the end of Alzheimer's cookbook. And um, I mean, why not? Right. Because food is such an important part of this. What, what do you think is the best brain health diet to keep 
your brain young. And I heard you say mild ketosis. Give give our listeners an actual example of what you would suggest, like actually what you would have for breakfast, lunch, dinner, because we know what that means, but we yeah. need them yeah. to hear practically what that means. Yeah. And so again, you know, you want to be in the one 0.0 to 4.0 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, we're just actually testing an interesting breathalyzer that might make this much easier, I hope. Uh, and as far as what to eat, I think we've all come to the same conclusion that simple carbs are really damaging for your brain. And of course, MRI studies show it, your spec scan studies show it. Uh, all these things show that this is a problem. So what you want to do, uh, and I know during COVID-19, one of the things I found very interesting is just to do chronometer. Free yeah, app you can look at you know, uh, and just basically record what are you having each day and you can look at your percentage. So you want a high good fats diet, mm -hmm. um, a low carbohydrate diet. And we're talking about typically about 75% of the calories coming from good fats about 10% coming from carbs, and about 15% or so coming from proteins, somewhere in the kind of 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of good proteins, and make them, you know, good, you know, fish, uh, or if it's going to be chicken, pastured chicken, and if it's going to be beef, grass-fed beef, so that you've got a good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. And if, for the fish, of course, the smash fish. So for breakfast, um, actually, my wife has breakfast every morning and typically has a salad. Uh, and uh, I think it's a great idea. So many of these breakfast foods we've come to, to know and love uh, can just skyrocket your, your uh, glucose. They have high glycemic indices. So you don't want to go and, and you know, get up and have something like uh, you know a, a breakfast cereal that's got a lot mm -hmm. of carbs in it. You want to have something that's going to be uh, good fats, you know, eggs. Uh, and get some good pastured eggs, which I, I love for breakfast. I think it's a great way to go. Uh, and then- Sort of uh, like eggs and avocado with a little spinach. Absolutely. Eggs, avocado, spinach, um, and you know, good oils to go with a, a salad. So then you know, for lunch, maybe you have uh, a big, you know, again, make salad the big part of your plate. Uh, and you, know, you, you, can, uh, you can have some, have some fish at lunch with your salad. Mm -hmm. um, Best to have the smash fish, of course, as you know, the salmon, mackerel, uh, anchovies, sardines, and herring, uh, and just stay away from the high mercury fish, of course, um, which are the ones you know, the, the shark and the and the tuna uh, and the and the swordfish and things like that. Uh, and then you know, for dinner, um, you might have uh, you might have something like uh, some pastured chicken. Uh, and, you know, again, you, you, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to have a, a, a plate full of uh, chicken or steak, um, have, you know, greens. Maybe you have some, uh, you know, maybe you have some broccoli. Uh, the crucifers are fantastic, as you know, for detox. Um, and, of course, the whole lectin issue has been really interesting. Some mm -hmm. people are very sensitive to these, some people not. And so it's good to see whether you are sensitive to lectins or not. Um, and so one thing that we've often wanted, because people always say, well, well, I don't understand how much protein that is. And if people aren't where they can measure and actually figure it out, I always tell them to shake hands with protein. What do you say about that? Absolutely. Or a good yeah. way to measure if you're out? A card deck, you know, something like that is right. a, kind of the right amount. So, you know, card deck size is going to give you something like uh, four ounces or so. Right. Uh, I you actually have a little scale. Right. But if you're out. Kitchen counter. Well, you have to learn, and it's better to learn at home. Right. And during the pandemic, um, I, I noticed my weight started to go up. And what I do is I put a tape measure around my waist. And all of you who are listening, do not go by your pant size. The clothing industry knows you're irritated by your weight, and they just lie. So a 30 four may actually be 37. And one of the pastors I treat, I'm like, Hey, what's your waist size? He said 40. And I put a waist, I put a tape measure around his waist. I barely could get it around. It was 48. I'm like, dude, you're he was four feet feet yeah. around and measure at your belly button. But I'd put on like an inch and a half, which really irritated me. And so what I do when my weight starts to go up is I actually start counting everything I put in my mouth because I think of calories like money and I'm a value spender. And, and as you weigh and measure things, you really know what you're putting in your body 
that's how you, if you're having trouble maintaining your weight, eating like Tana talks about or right. Dale talks about, We're then right the make seat. sure you're not eating too much because sometimes the oils are very calorie dense and you have to be careful. So, and so between the two of us, we sort of balance each other out. My, my issue isn't the, like, I don't count calories because I sort of already know in my head how many calories things are essentially. Um, for me, it's more the quality of the calories. And so between the two of us, you know, he's always paying attention to the calories and I, and I do agree well, they, no, they I matter. I pay attention to, cal- to the calories. Right. So that between the two of us. More. Right. Right. So, but you can eat more. And it doesn't really show up in your way for me because I have obesity. In well, my I also family, exercise a lot. But I also have obesity in my family. So it's just something for me. I know it's one of the risk factors. So I would totally have this sweet type of Alzheimer's disease. My grandfather was a candy maker. And so my best memories were making candy with my grandfather. And so I have to really work on that part. Right. And so between the two of us, we sort of balance out with that. And, and you know, Daniel, what you were describing, this is the COVID cushion. That yes. Everyone, so the COVID-19. <laughs> COVID cushion we're all getting from, you know, being at home. And, and part of it, of course, is anxiety. And these it sort of, is. But you it know, is. And you were just talking about the, the quality of the calories. And one of the things that's come out of this, you know, you look at all the different things, the iodine that you need, the magnesium. So many of us are deficient in zinc and magnesium. And I think the one that has of most concern right now to me is choline. Uh, you know, you need about 550 milligrams a day of choline. Most of us are deficient in that. And this is a huge problem because you cannot make the acetylcholine that is the most important transmitter for memory and is reduced in Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. So I really suggest to everyone, please make sure you are getting enough choline each day. And you can do that with a shrimp. supplement, but you can do it with the shrimp eggs. or eggs, eggs right? yeah. liver, you know, organ mm-hmm. meats, things like that, um, oysters, things like that. Um, so there, there are a number of ways, but you're absolutely right. Of course, Professor Richard Workman from MIT spent so many years looking at synaptic, what's required to make synapses. And his, and his uh, ultimate conclusion was critical to have citicoline and to have omega-3s. So if you're not getting enough choline, you could take citicoline, you can take lecithin, you can take phosphatidylcholine, you can take GPC choline. So lots of ways to get your choline, but please get enough choline. Great. Well, you have just been such a blessing uh, to us and to so many people who have read your book, worked your program. The new book is called The End of Alzheimer's Program. Uh, It's by Random House. You can get it anywhere. Great books are sold. Um, How else can people learn about you and your work? Uh, Where can they go? Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel and Tana. Just absolutely great talking to you guys. Uh, always enjoy it. Thank you. Um, you can go to drbredison.com. You can go to mycognoscopy.com. You know, we all know about getting a colonoscopy. You want to get a cognoscopy, see where you stand, as you indicated earlier. So mycognoscopy.com or drbredison.com or apollohealthco.com. Okay, I'm going to spell that out. It's Dr. B R E D E S E N.com drbredison.com just so people can find you so please um post something you've learned today post a question um tag us if you will or send a screenshot go to brainwarriorsway.com brainwarriorswaypodcast.com and leave us a review question comment we would love to hear from you if you're enjoying the brain warriors way podcast please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855 978-1363.